of the T Degree in Golf podcast with Victor Patterson. We are privileged today to have a trailblazer, an accomplished golfer, and someone who is paying it forward through being a coach of young student athletes. Team, we are privileged to have on this episode, Coach Misha LaVister, head golf coach of the Prairie View A&M University men and women's golf team. Coach, welcome to the Tita Green Golf Podcast. It is a thrill to have you with us today. Such a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. Thank so you. excited. Well, let's get started and please go ahead and introduce yourself to the Tita Green Golf Podcast community, your name, where you're from. Uh, I talked about your position, but certainly you can go to go into that a little further if you'd like. So I am Misha Levister. I am um, the head men's and women's golf coach at Prairie View A&M University in Prairie View, Texas. So we are part of the Texas A&M system and super happy to be a Panther and be on the hill. And that's South Texas, right? Somewhere around Houston? Am I, am Southeast. I yeah. You are. Yep. So we're about 45 minutes uh, northwest of Houston. So we're right between Houston and Austin. So come on and see us. Right. So for those of you that are looking for a place to play golf, we'll certainly get into that a little bit later. And if that place has nothing to do with winter, I think you can rest assured that uh, South Texas will spare you of that experience for at least four years, maybe five. Well, Let's get right into it. Um, your golf journey. When did it start? Did you play other sports? And ultimately, why golf? Um, I grew up as, I'm an athlete. I've always been an athlete. So my dad was an athlete. So we, I started playing golf when I was three. Um, but of course, as any child, you want to learn every sport. So right. I played little league baseball. I played, I never played softball for some reason, but um tried to venture into kind of every sport to kind of see what I was good at. And mm -hmm. I, I ended up being pretty decent at golf. And, you know, I learned it. I learned how to play basketball, like in the sixth, seventh grade. And I got good at that pretty quick, you know, enough to play varsity basketball and golf. And you know, ultimately golf was a little harder. So, you know, I kind of mm -hmm. chose golf. It's just a little more of a passion for me. So natural athlete, and through going back and forth and trying other sports, you found your path. I, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question that is really, really interesting. You know, I think today as we see kids growing up, um, they're encouraged and depending on the community, sometimes forced to play one sport, understanding that, do you have an opinion on that? Can you talk about the value of playing multiple sports versus just playing one sport and the impact that that had on you as an athlete? My, my parents allowed me to play kind of whatever I wanted to play. You know, of course, my dad, you know, and my mom, they wanted us to be outside. We were outside kids and they made sure mm -hmm. that we did all that stuff. So we had bats and balls and those kind of things available to us and you know it's kind of whatever we took to like my little brother he played some soccer and okay. my little sister she played a little bit of everything she ended up swimming in high school i ain't got nothing for that <laughs> but you know for <laughs> yeah, i don't not me um but you know i think it's important to be in that journey and kind of play multiple sports kind of to see what you like mm -hmm. um because i mean people do have burnout when it comes to certain sports. So, you know, for me, I think I got tired of a couple of the other sports and I was like, mm, let's move on to that. But I, I found myself kind of addicted to more harder sports. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of why golf fit me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all sports are hard, but I think that playing multiple sports is kind of a great thing. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to be at a high level, like I would kind of, instead of playing five or six, like, just one or two or possibly three, depending on where you're really good at. I mean, it's just my opinion, but I think that kind of sticking to a couple, you know, if you're worse at one, like if you're playing golf, football, baseball, um, like kind of hone that down to whatever you're, you're really good at. 
I, I share that with you. And so my bias comes out here. I'm somebody that tried multiple sports as well. And I think to your point, as I grew from a child to, you know, I guess a teenager, um, I started to narrow that down. And for me, it ultimately, ultimately was basketball. Uh, so I, I, I stand with you in, in that position, that opinion. When you, when you think about golf and you've talked about golf being a harder sport, what was the hook for you? And at what point in this journey did you say, this is going to be the sport, I'm going to make the investment. And as they often say, the rest is history. For me, um, you know, kind of being pretty decent at basketball, like I got an, I got an offer or two for basketball and then, you know, kind of golf. I just, for me, I didn't see enough representation. Mm -hmm. So I found that I chose golf to go play college collegiately just because there weren't that many people that looked like me. So at what point do you say, hey, there's a lot of people over here, you know, but where is that honey hole? So for me, like I said, I gravitated to the harder sport. I've always kind of been one of those kind of out of the box people that I, I, I've never been much of a follower. I don't think that's kind of, that's never been my path. Like you don't never know that at, at 17 years old, but you know, when there's less people that look like me and I want to be able to set a trend, like I wanted to be, you know, the great, I wanted to be the Nancy Lopez that was black. Right, right. And, and so I, I think that the point about not being a follower, but being a more trailblazer, we'll get into that later into this episode. And for the TD Green Golf Podcast community, my hope is that you kind of listen to this episode, maybe more intently than you've listened to some that have been released because this is truly a really, really good story. But coach, staying on the point about representation, can you talk about how important that is? Um, and maybe it was a subconscious thought at the time, but talk about how important it is today and how the HBCU golf community can really be a place of progress, um, acceleration, comfort, and all of the good attributes for uh, for student athletes of color who are really now starting to flood the 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 playing golf community going forward. I think that it, it's so important what we're doing here at HBCUs when it comes to golf. I mean. You know, sometimes everybody has that great dream to go to your bigger schools, but, you know, especially as a division one HBCU, like we still compete with them. So right. with, with your bigger schools, we're still going to compete with some of the, the people like we played the University of Southern California this year. Right. That's huge for that's huge for HBCU golf in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you don't want to. If you're trying to be the next Tiger or whomever, you know, you're trying to be the next Joe Smo that's on the tour, like at the end of the day, you got to be playing. So, you know, you got to make those decisions to say, hey, OK, I'm going to develop here. You know, what am I going to get out of a coach? But how can I be great and how can I expand the future of golf? So, you mm -hmm. know, for a lot of the kids, it's like they don't understand that they're role models. But we have a platform here that HBCU golf is hot and a lot of things are done on the golf course that people may not understand. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're, you're making connections and these lifelong connections could, they could really get you the bag. And that's, you know, those are the things that people have to look at. And HBCU, being at an HBCU, not only do you get the culture and you get to have that experience, it's a wonderful experience, yep. but you also get to play high level golf. So, you know, I think it's super important to kind of take a look at it and don't be just so enamored with other things because you can get a great coach, you can get a great education, and you can have a great experience in HBCU. Love that answer. And I would also offer to our TD Green Golf community, for the children of color, it gives a sense of self. And if only for four, four and a half, five years, you can immerse yourself in a community that is authentically you, um, that believes in you, 
that gives you the level of confidence to compete athletically, get a quality education before going out into a very active, aggressive, and sometimes dismissive world, then it is absolutely worth the investment. And as, as someone who attended Norfolk State, um, after going to a PWI, my freshman year on a basketball scholarship, I've openly talked about the value that Norfolk State played in my life and, and my commitment to Norfolk State for the rest of my life. So I love the answer. Uh, and I hope that for those that are listening, you can piece together what Coach said along with us, with, with what I shared and help your student athlete in that process if um, if they're struggling in a community that is not representative of, of them going forward. Coach, one of the things that I alluded to earlier is that you have an amazing history. And, and, and so let me say this, for those of you that find yourself intrigued by Coach Misha, um, Google her name. There is a site that will really take you through her journey beyond what we'll talk about today. And it is truly about not being a follower. It is being a trailblazer in a number of ways. Um, as a player, you know, help us understand the approach that you took not only to succeed in the state of Florida, but to succeed in parts of the Atlantic seaboard and up and down the coast. To, you know, talk to us about that journey um, for adults and the children that may be listening to this episode. Oh, for sure. So for me, it's, I didn't have it the easiest. So a lot of the stuff that I had to learn was kind of on my own or with, mm -hmm. you know, kind of my father's help. And, you know, I passed him in the game of golf when I was 16. Nice. So, you know, he learned what he learned as a male that started in his late 20s, early 30s. Um, but, you know, as I progressed and I started beating him, there was things that he just couldn't teach me anymore. And, you know, we don't, I don't come from money. My parents didn't have all the money and those kind of things. But, you know, it, it was more about how do you get it done? So, for me, that's kind of my, always been my approach. How do, how do you get this done? So, you know, I kind of take a more psychological approach than some people may, but it's about how am I going to progress? So I'm not going to lie. When I, when I started playing golf, like I, I was a ball striker, you know, I hit it a long way. You know, I hit it probably 280 on average, okay. you know, I, I could hit three wood longer than most people's driver. And so for me, it was like, okay, well, yeah, I'm good at this. And this is what everybody sees. And yeah, I can shoot even par and stuff like that. I can do those things. Right. But at what point do I have to learn how to score? Absolutely. You know, I, I have to, my bad day has to be better because these other girls are whooping my tail. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I got out there, I had to figure that out. And that's mm -hmm. by learning. That's by being a sponge and that's by i had to take my leader qualities and the leading that i have been doing and i had to become a follower and i think it's important for people especially young people to know your lane sometimes you're going to have to be a follower so you can learn how to lead you know you just don't like everybody can be born a leader but you don't know how to lead it so Right. So I had to learn how to follow even because there was no one in front of me that I could really look at and say, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. So that was the that's kind of how I approached the game. I, I approached the game as a student first. Um, and, you know, and but I had that dog in me. So I also had to have a little killer mentality because my daddy would have. We're not going to talk about that, but. <laughs> You know, I you know, know, I know. Yeah. So, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta, I'm a very nice person, but yep. you know, my dad was like, you got to step on their throat. Like, right. so I had to take that. But at some point you got to learn what it is that this person's doing that's whooping your tail. And that's yes. what I had to do. So I think a few things, you know, and, and, and I think the mentality <laughs> is it's appropriate to talk about this and, you know, it sounds like the environments that you and I grew up in were very similar. And I often talk about when you meet Victor Patterson, 
there's a whole nother Victor Patterson that you didn't get to meet. And that was the person who was that dog who was on the playgrounds in Metro Chicago. And, uh, you know, on a Saturday or Sunday, I'm with my mom and I'm the most cordial, respectful individual that you could possibly come across. When four o'clock came and I was lacing those sneakers up, then I, I wasn't that person that you saw two or three days ago. And I think it's appropriate and it's necessary to compete at the highest levels to have that mentality. I think the other thing that you talked about is understanding your strengths and weaknesses. And so a lot of this goes back to what you talked about earlier about the HBCU experience, about that experience really starting to lead you into life and knowing your strengths, but making sure that you work on your weaknesses and golf is critical. And I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but for the community, I think it's important to know that. I also think with the dog is the need to be committed and committed and practice and grind and practice and grind and practice and grind. And that's how you go from 89 to 72 or 81 to 72 or 81 to 75. So just a few paperclip moments for the T to green golf podcast community to, to, to take away um, early in this episode. Coach, we've talked about um, this in, you know, I know that you went back to coaching or stepped into coaching in during the pandemic in 2020. Um, why that decision? And when you, when you made that decision coming off such an accomplished playing career, what did you envision? Where were you headed? Well, I, I always tell people that coaching found me. Okay. So it, it's not, um, you know, I, I played on the tour until um, 2014. And then my father died in October 14. And it kind of shifted my perspective a little bit. And, you know, now I became, you know, my mom was a widow. So I stepped away from that life, not because I didn't have status, because I did. Mm -hmm. But because my mother needed me and family was more important. Okay. She didn't, I mean, she told me to stay, but it, it wasn't like that to me. It's like, my mother needs me and she has done everything, you know, her and my father have done everything. So that's kind of how I kind of stepped away from it. Mm -hmm. So at some point I had to get a big girl job. Mm -hmm. So I went and I got out of the golf business, which was the dumbest decision I've ever made. But you know, the, the reason that I got out of the golf business was because I had a boss of mine tell me that Misha, you will never be a director of golf because you're a black female. And at that point, time to go. You know, you don't believe in me. When I believe in myself, you're not the yeah. guy for me. Right. So, you know, so I was like, okay, well, let me go. I was making $11 an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's no money, but I enjoyed my life. I enjoyed mm -hmm. my job. Like I got to teach people, I got to do, you know, certain things, but you know, I got a big girl job. I went into corporate America and baby, it was the, ooh, I won't do that no more. I got some valuable experience, but yes, you, will you know, get that. no, but you know, it was, you know, it, it put me in the hospital. It, it's the first time I'd ever been hospitalized, but the stress of yep. me working at a major corporation kind of yep. in a management role, it put me in the hospital and, and the timing of it was nothing but God. And I mean, I'm going to tell you that right now, because shortly after that, I got a call from uh, Dr. Ingrid Rickman McCree, who was the former uh, AD at North Carolina Central, and was like, Misha, you want to coach? I just mm -hmm. paraphrased that. She said a little something different, but. Right, sure. And I was like, okay. And she was like, well, it's only going to pay this little amount of money. So I took a $40,000 pay cut to coach. So, you know, my my resume from golfing and stuff like that, like they didn't care about that in, in corporate world. Right. Right, but they did. So when I got a chance to you know, coaching, okay, I can help some college kids. That's the only place I haven't been. No brainer. Let's go. So yeah. with the support of my family, that's kind of how I stepped in the coaching in a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was, it, it's been a ride for sure. For the last four years, it's been definitely been a ride. And again, I think that goes back to you being, the trailblazer. We know that you went from NCCU 
uh, for those of you that are curious, it's North Carolina Central University. It is also an HBCU of the many in the state of North Carolina. We know that you went there and you started or you continued that blaze trail in Missouri. And I believe that was Lincoln mm -hmm. University there. In 2022, um, you were named the head golf coach, I believe in your current position. Talk to us about that. Um, why, what was the motivation or what has the experience been like? So I on the, when I was an assistant at North Carolina Central, um, the head coach had to go with the boys somewhere and she asked me to bring the girls to Houston. And I was like, cool, I've never been to Texas, let's go. <laughs> so, you know, our the team that I was coaching got to play with the Prairie View A&M girls that were there. Okay. Okay. And then I kind of got to meet uh, CJ Potter, who is our head athletic trainer. <laughs> and he had taken kind of, they had, they didn't have a head coach. So he had kind of taken the reins and, you know, he was doing what he had to do and kind of learning the ropes. And, you know, I was like, oh, okay. So when I met the girls, saw Texas, I was like, hmm, I don't think I will mind Texas a little bit. Yeah. And so, you know, I had another offer. Lincoln had say, hey, we want you. Um, and I told him, I was like, kind of like Texas, Division One, kind of want to stay there. Let me, I'm going to apply for this job. <laughs> so I applied for the job. I did not get the job. Okay. So they gave it to another coach who Correct. will remain nameless. Correct. Uh, and I love him to death. Um, but, you know, he he decided after a couple months that this wasn't the place for him. And then I got a phone call. So, you know, I was enjoying my little time at Lincoln. I'm not going to lie. Dr. Wilson, he was great. Um, Jefferson City, Missouri was great. Lincoln University, great. Yeah. Um, but Prairie View called and I entertained it and I was like, this might be for me. So that's kind of how my journey to Prairie View kind of came in. And, you know, it's been a great ride. Like it's been to kind of come in and change the culture and mm -hmm. move the needle forward. It, it's, it's been, it's been amazing. You know, talk a little bit about that, where you're at. Where, where, the, where the program was, where the program is, and where you see the program going. So the men's program was a winning program um, okay. Okay. Under, under Kevin Jennings. So, I mean, great coach, great guy, you know, he, but he had upward mobility. So he went to another school okay. doing great things. Um, and I don't know what happened before I got here, but you know, they didn't have an official head coach. They had some interims. Miss Pete was doing her thing, kind of running the program. Cool. So when I finally came in, you know, there was, there had to be a culture shift. Uh, the, the kids kind of craved a little structure mm -hmm. and I didn't know what I was doing, but that's okay. You mm -hmm. know, I had done a little coaching and I had seen how Dr. Green did the things at uh, North Carolina Central. So I kind of implemented some of the things that she did. I kind of implemented some of the things from the other coaches that I had talked to and kind of gave them, them sh that structure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the men's team finished last in SWAC or something like that. The girls team finished uh, probably close to last or somewhere like that the year I wasn't here. And then, you know, it was, it was time to work. So, you know, kind of fresh face, fresh mentality, kind of gave them a renewed vibe. The girls ended up winning. The girls team ended up winning two tournaments in the 22, 23 school year, which was amazing. Yes. Um, the guys, you know, they did a little something, something, but you know, it, no wins, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was about kind of cementing, Hey, I'm here. I'm not leaving you. And so I, when I came in, it was all about the love they wanted to be loved. And I love them. I love all these kids. Anybody that comes to this program, I love them. Like, and that's, I don't have any kids, so they are my kids. Right. Um, so that's kind of, you know, but we're going to continue to grow at Prairie View. We're always going to continue to grow. Um, we're going to continue to get better, yep. um, you know, because I don't just want to compete for SWAC championships at the end of yep. the day. I want to I want to compete for a national championship. I'm too competitive not to. Love it. You know, 
And, and, and listen, certainly your playing history would suggest that. When when you think about your coaching philosophy, can you talk to us about that? And and also, when you think about recruitment, what does the profile look like of a Prairie View A and M student athlete golfer? Kind of what I look for. I always look for a student first because I wholeheartedly believe that a great student in the classroom will be a great student on the golf course. Love it. And and that's part of being that sponge. Like I said, I had to learn everything by just trying to be a sponge. So, you know, it's about being coachable and it's about kind of knowing, hey, I want to get better. I have these aspirations, but, you know, I, I try to find a lot of diamonds in the rough mm -hmm. because I think they deserve a chance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Prairie View is a great school, great campus. So you, you come to campus, you'll understand it. But sure. that that's kind of what I look for first. Um, I look for kids that are going to be able to be held accountable because at the end of the day, everybody messes up. Love it. I messed up. So right. Right. I'm not going to fault you for it, but don't do anything that that is detrimental to the rest of your life. Correct, correct, be correct. Because it's about, it's not about just what you do and now, like you have to think about all those things. So it's about kind of teaching kids that are ready to become adults and having that maturation process. Those are the kind of kids that I want. The ones that are kind of ready to, they gotta have a little dog in them. Like I said, they, mm -hmm. they gotta have a little bit in them, you know, and, and or they have to have, a, they might not see it, but I see it and it's time to let the, come on, come on, let's yank the chain a little bit, come on. Yeah. So those are the things that we that I try to do. And, you know, I want to get that person that wants to have a great college experience. If you're just here just to play golf, then this ain't the school for you. Sure. And, and listen, from coast to coast, from east to west and then from north to south, um, got a little bit of insight into what coach looks for in in a student athlete and, and student first. And then athlete second. So hopefully, just uh, just a little bit, we've intrigued those in the Tita Green Golf Podcast community that uh, that are looking for a place to feel welcomed, um, to be represented, to have a tremendous student experience, to grow, and to ultimately play Division One competitive golf against some of the schools that you might see televised at different points in time during the academic year. Coach, we are, uh, you're, you're approaching two years and I hit a little bit on this, but knowing where the program is right now, where do you see it going? And some of that I, I think is, some of the question is baked in, as you continue working with your AD, are there areas and level of competition that the program has to nudge up just a level? Um, what does the future look like? I think the future is bright. I mean, we've we've got to we've gotten to kind of go to some pretty cool places over the last year, and it's it's more about trying to garner relationships and to give them a better experience. So, you know, we got to go play at University of uh, California, San Diego. So my boys team got to go play Torrey Pines, yeah, you know, yeah. and then, you know, the girls got to go play Grand Reserve where they played the PGA Tour event, you know. So you wanna, that's still back to the student athlete experience. Sure. So I think that as the experiences get better, they're going to continue to be better kids that come in. And I think that that's important, okay. you know, because you want to have those experiences, all these really huge schools, they're going to these cool places. So why not, why not Prairie View? Right. You know, right. why, you know, so maybe I shrunk the schedule a little bit. So you're not playing eight tournaments in the spring, but you're playing four or five really quality golf courses and you're getting that competition because the more, you get that competition, there's going to be another kid that sees it like, oh, well, I've never heard of Prairie View. Let me research it. Because at the end of the day, I was the same way. 
I had never heard of Prairie View A&M. I'm from the East Coast. Right. But when right. I go see and I see the kids and I see the purple and gold, I'm like, oh, all right. And I, that's how I want. <laughs> that's kind of how I want people to look at it. Like, I want them to ask questions. I redesigned the bag so that it was purple. And it had camo. And I wanted people to ask questions about that bag because it starts a conversation. Yeah, And, and so I love everything that we've talked about. And, and listen, for those of you that are in the East Coast, the Midwest, and I'm a Chicagoan and, and, and not really trying to paint a broad brush, but I know that in the Midwest, um, Prairie View A&M is going to come into the conversation far less than it is in the state of Texas. And even for those out West, again, embrace this episode, be curious about Prairie View A&M University, um, explore that curiosity and really let's give the kids an opportunity, your kids, your neighbors, um, children in your church, wherever they may be, an opportunity to have a wholesale experience for four or five years uh, with a schedule that is likely going to get increasingly more competitive, um, new, different, and interesting places to travel. Let's do that. And again, we've heard from coach, your philosophy is be a competitive dog. You're going to be coached, uh, be curious, but also compete. Uh, I'm not sure that as a former athlete, there's much more that you can ask for from a coach. And, and, and uh, I think it's all canvassed around the caring nature uh, of the coach as well. And as she indicated, she loves boys and, and, and girls team. So uh, a really, really ideal situation for a young 17, 18 year old to the community. One of the things that I've talked about um, in this episode is the accomplished playing career of of coach misha and the abbreviated version is one state title in the state of florida as a high school student um had playing privileges professionally during and in between all of that won the virginia state amateur also won the mid-atlantic amateur she's talked about having playing privileges on tour and so we celebrate that from every imaginable angle. Coaches, I think about that accomplishment. And, and as I've talked about, these episodes are for the casual golfer who wants to be the competitive amateur. They're for the teenager or the junior that wants to position themselves to play golf in college. When I think about what you likely went through to achieve what you've achieved, are there two or three nuggets that you say to the TD Green Golf Podcast community to elevate your game, invest in these. Invest in yourself. <laughs> that's, that's the big one. You always have to invest in yourself. Um, you know, the, the biggest one for me is have fun. I know that the journey to be a great golfer can be very tedious and it can get mundane. So, you know, that's kind of how, you know, I approach it a little bit differently than some other coaches will where, you know, practice is fun for us. You know, it, you know, we, we incorporate a little cardio slash wedge work where we're right. at just because I know how that is. So, you know, it, it, you don't have to go to the golf course to be great. You know, sometimes you can go in your backyard and you can work on some things so, you know, have fun with it, figure out different ways, trial and error. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of one of those nuggets, trial and error. Mm -hmm. You find something and you do it well, do it well, you know, and it's about short game. <laughs> right. That there That's going to be, that's a big one. There short is. game is a big one. You got to get the ball in the hole. You can hit it 350 and not be able to hit a wedge and you're going to shoot 80 or you're going to shoot 85. So it, it doesn't matter how far you hit it. Like distance helps. I'm not gonna lie. Don't, right. don't say I didn't say that. Right. Distance definitely helps. <laughs> right. But at the same time, like being a great golfer, that it there's no there's no picture on a scorecard. So if you hit it, you dink it down there two forty, and you hit it to 
20 feet and your two putt is still a par. Absolutely. Or if you drove the green in three putt, it's the same number. Right, right. You know, so, and that's kind of why I don't shy away from playing with the kids. They hit it 70 yards past me, but don't worry about it. I'll get you where it counts. Right, correct. <laughs> so those, those, are the, those are kind of the little nuggets. So you want to work on your short game. You want to have some fun and invest in yourself. Go get a lesson. Like, mm-hmm. go find a buddy that's better than you and get beat. What what <laughs> what better if you're a, if you're really a competitive golfer you want to have that competitive edge go get beat because you're going to find a way not to get beat. I love that piece, and I think when today when we hear the invest in yourself, I think it directly sends us to a certified teacher or PGA pro. But but I think you just added a a, a bit of a a, a, a a tweak to that and said, consider playing with someone who's better than you and see, I love that and see if you could take it. And, and really that's, again, for, for a number of people, that's something that, that can resonate. If you think about playing basketball, which you did growing up, you know, you couldn't go to an NBA pro or Division One college coach and say, instruct me. You found yourself on the playground with somebody that was probably two or three years older than you. And that one way or another propelled you to get better. So conceptually, I love that idea. And then if if a certified teacher is part of the plan, then, then invest in that. But, uh, I, I, I love that. And, and it's a, it's a key takeaway. Coach, as we get to the end of the episode, one of the things that I always ask is how can the Teeter Green Golf Podcast community support you, the Prairie View A&M University men's and women's golf teams? How can we do that and keep the good work that you're doing at the forefront i mean honestly i mean you know everything comes down to a couple coins but for me i think it's more about follow us on social media like reach out you know if you have a business or something like give these kids an nil deal or something like that help them become better adults or help them ease into that adulthood or you know, have them help you or something like that. We we love community here and stuff like that. So, you know, be a part of the community. Support the athletic department at Prairie View. Come see us play other sports other than golf. Mm-hmm. You know, those are big things for us that kind of drive a lot of those things. Come out and support if we're in your in your town because that will drive the kids to play better and get those wins that are ultimately going to bring everything else. So it's really the small, low-level things that will help us in the long run. You know, get your tax write off though. Don't don't I ain't afraid to get some ducats from you, but you know, it's a tax write off, but <laughs> worth but, the investment. You know, it is. And that, and that, and for me that's the big thing. So, you know, trying to make this experience so much better and I think that some of the partners that we have partnered with are helping to aid in that. But anybody can help aid in that. You know, kind of come just ask, like just send an email, say, "Hey, how can we help you?" You know, and you know, it, it may be just you sending us some training aids or it could be you just come volunteer somewhere Mm -hmm. just come be with us if you're high profile people just say hi you know it it can be just as organic as that it can be monetary can be organic like the big one is just follow us follow these kids let them know that you care and that you support them and that's the big thing don't ridicule them just hey be a mentor for them. I think that's that's huge for college golf and for the program in itself is just to kind of put us up there so don't try to tear us down. Well, you've heard it. We've had an insightful conversation with Coach Misha, head men's and women's golf coach at Prairie View A&M in Prairie View, Texas. Coach, we thank you for your time. As I shared with you today and and on our calls previously, 
I was looking forward to this episode and I'm thankful that we did it. To the TD Green Golf Podcast community, there has been a call to support, as is the case with, uh, with previous episodes. We thank you for downloading and listening to this episode. You are encouraged to follow Prairie View A&M University Golf Program. You can go into Instagram and type Prairie View A&M and it will come up. We ask that you support the program and the university. Uh, we also appreciate the download. And as we always say, hit it straight from T to Green. We are out.